Welcome to Apostolic Voice, the podcast, episode one. I'm so glad that you're here today. We're going to be looking at one of my newest poems, The Burden of Truth. I'm also featuring a poem by the great Christian poet Scott Carnes called Recitation. If you think poetry is boring, I promise you it's not. Stick around and let's go. I'm probably not starting this podcast thing off correctly, talking about poetry, reading poetry, featuring poetry, Uh, but I do love it, and it is a little-known pastime of mine. I slip it into the blog. On occasion, it usually flies under the radar, although over the years, some of you have uh, read them in your church or read them dramatically as a play or a ministry moment. Some people have even turned it into a song, and that's been really enjoyable to to read those things, see those things. I appreciate you sharing it. Poetry is uh, certainly not the most popular art form out there, nothing like uh, its cousin art form, songwriting or singing, but there is a there is a powerful element to poetry, just something about the way it flows when done correctly, it can be incredibly moving. We've all read, in fact, I feel like the majority of poems that I read are are probably not worth reading. It seems like I have to wade through about a hundred just to get to one good one. But when you find a powerful poem, it's like a little nugget that just hits you right in the center of your soul. I think good poetry certainly apostolic poetry should have a, a meaning behind it, a meaning that that can be found, not something so obscured and vague that you can't come to some kind of understanding. Perhaps there'll be artistic nuances, but in the end, the meaning will shine through. I think good poetry should be written in that way. I try to do that. I I don't write poetry naturally. In fact, usually it's in a time of prayer. Uh, it'll just come come flooding to me, and I just can't write it down fast enough. But if I just sat down and said, oh, I'd like to write a poem, I, I, I can't do it. It's just not possible. But from time to time, not often enough, but from time to time, the Lord will will put something on my heart, and I just have to write it down. The poem that I'm featuring today of mine called The Burden of Truth, is written from the perspective of me, a pastor, a minister, a preacher, uh, to and for ministers, preachers, pastors, lay ministers, people who carry the weight of the gospel, the responsibility, the feeling of responsibility. Really, everyone is called to, to share the gospel, to spread the gospel, but there's something about the burden that God gives the ministry. It's a heavy burden, and it can sometimes feel as though it's a a lonely and thankless burden. And that's what this poem really is about. But it's also an ode to the bravery and the heroism of those who, who bear the weight of truth with grace and dignity. I hope you enjoy it. The burden of truth is heavy. Sometimes it feels like too much to bear. The weight of knowledge is forever. It grips the heart with an icy stare. Wandering soldiers know that home is elusive. They search for solace, yet it's just not there. They look for hope in the strangest places. They search for kindness in angry faces. The burden of truth is an honor to carry. It hurts much more than we show or share. The cost of honor is expensive. It takes a toll, yet most don't care. The dutiful soldier knows something of pain, a lesson that most have never retained. Opposition to truth brings death to the soul, so to the truth we tenderly hold. Dear one, remember that life is a vapor. It's not what we're feeling that matters the most, for hearts are deceitful and often don't know. It's where we are going that matters the most. What we touch today might be gone by tomorrow, making the burden of truth the blessing most hallowed, for what we can't see will endure beyond sorrow, and the depths of despair are blessedly shallow.
Hi, I wanted to tell you about Anchor. It's the best way to make a podcast. It's also the easiest way. And uh, for years, I've tried to do podcasting. It's been very hard. The technical side of things is difficult. But Anchor's made it easy, and it's completely free. They'll distribute your podcast for you, so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and all the other major platforms. You can make money from your podcast if you want to with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And so if this is something you've been interested in doing, you need to download Anchor now. Look for their free app or go to anchor.fm to get started. You'll be glad you did. Recitation by Scott Carnes He did not fall then, blind upon a road, nor did his lifelong palsy disappear. He heard no voice save the familiar, ceaseless self-interrogation of the sore perplexed. The kettle steamed and whistled, a heavy truck downshifted. Near the square, he heard a child calling, and heard a morning dove intone its one dull call. For all of that, his wits remained, quite dim. He breathed and spoke the words he read. If what had been long dead then came alive, that resurrection was by all appearances metaphorical. The miracle arrived without display. He held a book, and as he read, he found the very thing he'd sought, just that. A life with little hurt but one, the lucky gift of a raveled book, a kettle slow to heat, and time enough, therefore, to lift the book, and find in one slight passage the very wish he dared not ask aloud, until, that is, he spoke the words he read. I hope you enjoyed this poem by Scott Carnes. Recitation to me is is a moving poem that is really about revelation in the end. Specifically, the revelation that comes from the read and spoken word of God. We've all had experiences with, with the Bible where it was just a normal, average, ordinary day, and we were... We were just casually reading the scripture when the Lord hit us with a lightning bolt, a revelation, a miracle, something that was illuminated to us for the very first time. It's, it's, it's that light bulb moment where all of a sudden you're just like, yeah, I've, I've got it now. I, I understand it. Uh, something I've wrestled with, something that I've, that I've needed to, to come to fulfillment or fruition in my life, the Word of God just brings that to us. Oftentimes, unexpectedly, in, a, in an instant, it just happens. That's the power of the Word of God. And I think that this is the kind of moment that Carnes is talking about in the poem recitation. Now, he is specifically trying to bring out the idea of speaking the Word of God. Not only did the man in the poem read it on an order, ordinary average day, but he, but he spoke it. He recited it out loud. I think this is a metaphor for um, the idea of being obedient to the Word of God, to be a, a doer of the Word and not just a hearer of the Word. To speak it out, of course, we do have instances in Scripture where speaking something out is, is vital, for example, at baptism, we, we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are buried in that name. We take on that name in baptism. And so not only are we, not only are we reading and jesting or hearing the word of God, but we're applying it verbally. We call on the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. We have scripture for that. And this is a vital part of the Christian life and the Christian walk. And I think that Carnes captures just a snapshot uh, in a poetic, artful manner of an individual who has an interaction with God's Word that changes him forever. And this is the beauty of how God operates in this world. So often we read it in the Bible and your life, my life, 
just about anyone that you talk to who has a relationship with God will tell you of moments that just seemed mundane, maybe even boring, where suddenly God just overwhelms your senses, overwhelms your heart and your mind. What a powerful thing. And so I hope that you'll take this poem to heart and allow it to minister to you the way that it's ministered to me. I have a really bad habit of buying books and kind of sitting them on a shelf and getting caught up in a different book or something else and letting them sit there for years and years and years, only to pick it up later and think, my goodness, why didn't I read that a long, long time ago? And that's been the case with a book I'm holding in my hand right now called Preaching to a Shifting Culture. It was written in 2004 by Baker Books. Several authors and contributors to this book, I'm looking specifically today at chapter two, Uh, Chapter 2 is called The New Testament in the New Millennium by Vic Gordon, and uh, he makes a lot of of interesting points that I think are even more relevant today probably than than they were when he he first wrote them and was putting these thoughts together. Specifically, he's talking about preaching to a postmodern culture, and in some ways, we're even shifting beyond that. We're we're a post-truth, post- modern, post-minded, post-anything culture where really there, there's almost no emphasis left on truth. Everything, everything revolves around feelings or, or how something appeals to our, to our flesh in some way. That's the world that we live in now. And so preaching into this culture or witnessing. Maybe you're not a pastor or a preacher, but you are someone who understands that it's your calling to spread the gospel to everyone in your circle, in your community. In fact, it's it's your highest calling to try to reach people with the apostolic message of repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. This is this is the Christian mandate, the Christian calling for everyone. But it's harder than it's ever been because there was a time, we might call it the good old days perhaps, I never thought that I would think of the good old days as being the times when people would just get their Bibles out and argue with one another for hours. But it's even hard to do that now because most of the time when you're witnessing to someone, especially an unchurched person, someone who's not religious, a non-religious, some people call them call them knowns now. When you're reaching someone like that as best you can, you're not starting from the scripture or even from the questions of what is right and what is wrong. Actually, you're having to begin with, is there a such is there such a thing as right and wrong? It, is right even a thing? Is wrong even a thing? Is truth a thing? Is there any such thing as truth? And and this book it deals with that to a certain extent. And in chapter two here, he, he talks a lot about the way that Jesus preached. The primary focus of, of Jesus's preaching and teaching was on the subject of the kingdom of God. And let me read you a few things from chapter two here says this about about the middle of page 45. Reflecting further on Jesus' preaching on the kingdom, an immediate problem emerges. Even if a modern American Christian recognizes the centrality of the kingdom for Jesus, he or she automatically misunderstands the concept. Kingdom means something different in the biblical idiom, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, than in contemporary English. To us, kingdom means realm, a place over which a king rules, or a group of people who live in a king's realm, the people over whom a king rules. In the Bible, however, the primary meaning of kingdom is reign or rule. The kingdom of God thus means the reign of God or the rule of God. The kingdom of God is not a place nor a people, but God's active dynamic rule. The kingdom is an act of God, that is something he does. The good news is about God's reign. Of course, it's a metaphor, a word picture, describing a profound, 
reality. The phrase kingdom of God had developed a great deal in the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Kingdom of God now summarized the entire Old Testament hope. The first century Jews were expecting God to come as king and reign over the entire world, destroying his enemies and giving all his blessings to his people Israel. This concept was especially meaningful to the Jews, who on the one hand strongly believed that their God was the one and only true God who ruled over all the universe, and who on the other hand experienced over 700 years of foreign domination at the hands of pagan rulers from Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, and finally Rome. Now this part was fascinating to me. Listen to what Gibson says here. Jesus never defined the kingdom of God for them because they all knew what it meant. In the first century, the phrase kingdom of God summarized all of the Old Testament hope and promise. All that God has said and done in Israel's history is brought to completion in the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus didn't have to give a a graphic description to the people of what he meant by the phrase the kingdom of God. He knew they were expecting a a king, an earthly king, to come and reign and rule and overthrow dictators and overthrow their oppressors. But Jesus was speaking specifically of the kingdom of God being the rule and the reign of God within the world among a people who, even though they served the one true God, had not seen his rule and reign within the world. Look at what happens uh, in Mark 1.15, Jesus, Jesus startles and stuns his hearers when he says the, that the kingdom of God that they've all been waiting for is now present. The time of the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises have now arrived. He goes even further than this by teaching that the kingdom is present in his own person and ministry. That's Matthew chapter 11, 1 through 15. This teaching that the kingdom of God has arrived or is already here, was radically new. No Jewish rabbi had ever taught such a thing before, but Jesus, like most of the Jews of his day, also taught that the kingdom of God was still future. This is where you have to put your thinking cap on because we get a little deep here. In other words, the kingdom of God was present specifically because Jesus as the Messiah was present, but it was also yet to come at the same time. The solution to this strange teaching is to realize that Jesus' new perspective on the kingdom of God contains both elements. The kingdom is both present and future at the same time. This strange new perspective on the kingdom of God taught that the Old Testament promises could be fulfilled without being consummated. I like what Gibson says near the end of of chapter 2 here. Remember, again, he's speaking of preaching, specifically the difficulty of preaching truth into a postmodern culture, a postmodern mindset. People who reject truth or aren't even sure if there is truth, much like Pilate. What is truth is, is the mindset of our world today. And of course, 16 years ago, this was still a nugget, kind of an evolving concept. And today, we're just in full-blown rejection of truth even as a tangible thing. But here's what he says towards the end of chapter 2. Maybe our culture and our churches need a healthy dose of a subject that seems foreign to us. In a society of autonomous individuals, maybe the good news that God reigns needs to ring out. Maybe the church needs to hear that it is not a democracy, but that a group of followers of Jesus is called no less than individual followers to seek above all else the rule of Christ. Jesus, not the majority, reigns in the church, or at least he should. Maybe those of us who live in an anti-authoritarian age, and boy, do we ever live in an anti-authoritarian age, need to know that there is one who has authority. Indeed, all authority in heaven and on earth is his. Jesus Christ rules as King of kings and Lord of lords. In an age that is growing even more anti-authoritarian, it's imperative that the church remembers that we're not a political party, we're not, we're not a democracy, we're certainly not a communist society, but we are a group of people who are completely ruled 
by the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't get to vote truth into existence. We don't get to will truth into existence. We don't get to decide what truth is. Our opinions aren't aren't the beginning and the end of what should move our churches forward. No, no, knowing who Jesus is, is what does that. Let me give you one final quote from the book, Preaching to a Shifting Culture. Gibson, at the very end, right before the conclusion of chapter two, he quotes a a well-known scholar whom many of you have probably read, Gordon Fee. Gordon Fee described the early Christians, the first century Christians, as people who lived between times. Already the future had begun. Not yet had it been completely fulfilled. This already slash not yet perspective in which they believed themselves already to be living in the time of the end, even though it was yet to be consummated, is the eschatological framework that determines everything about them, how they lived, how they thought, and how they understood their own place in the present world, which was now understood to be on its way out. What an amazing thought that the first century Christians considered themselves to already be living in the end times. I think this gives a whole new framework to the reality that we are indeed coming to the end of this world. A whole new framework for understanding how we, as New Testament Christians, should view ourselves as being in tension, constantly pulled between the reality that God's final work is being completed in this world, even as we speak. Not only are things coming, but they're happening now. If there was ever a time that the church should have the mindset of the early Christians, it's now where we live with the realization that God's reign and rule, even though sometimes we look around and, and just like perhaps the Hebrews of the Old Testament, it seems like, it seems like God is not in control. But in reality, God is working all things together throughout the ages, throughout the tapestry of time. God is weaving the framework of the world. And now we see it wrapping up as never before. I'd like to encourage you today to remember that God is ruling his church. God has his hand operating in this world. No matter what COVID has done, no matter what elections do to us or how we feel about them, or even all of the things that are taking place in the world that seem so extreme, so so hard for us to really grasp. All of this is happening with the hand of God underpinning it. And we are truly living in the kingdom of God. One final thought I'd like to leave with you as, as I slip out of this first episode of Apostolic Voice. I want to encourage you to call your pastor, text your pastor, call a minister in your church, call a lay minister in your church, call a prayer warrior in your church, someone who does outreach, someone who is a leader, someone who bears the weight of the gospel. I'd like you to call them, text them, write them, get a hold of them in some way, take them to coffee, buy them a gift card, let them know how much you appreciate them. Until next time, God bless. God bless.